Um, so go now to urgent business, anything that I'm aware of? No, so we've picked up uh, those things and thank you for uh, people that have sent through in regard to the actions register. So they've been picked up with those, uh, any new requests, uh, any minor nature items? No, uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, any conflicts of interest? Uh, yes, Councillor Scott, with the... I just wanted to note my conflict in the bringing forward the future development areas. I will step out of the yep. room for that and also just around the Venture Timaru directorships. Thank you. Yeah, same with me, 9.14. 9 yeah, yep, perfect. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, the... 9.16 on the theatre, um, it is effectively receive a note in process, but um, as I said, which would be consistent with my not voting on the original, I'll tell you when the original, when I was a councillor, can hardly remember back that far, uh, in about 2018 or something like that. Uh, so it's consistent. So I'll just pass over to Councillor Shannon to chair that meeting. Um, so now we go to... Um, Confirmation of minutes, meeting on the 13th of February. Can I have a mover for that, please? Councillor Jackson, thank you. Seconder, Councillor Burt. Put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Kent's carried. Uh, we've got 8.1, which is schedules of functions attended by the Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Councillors. Uh, thank you, all those that have attended things on my behalf. Uh, it's been a busy wee period. Uh, I'll move that from the Chair. Can I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Jackson again, quick today. Well done. Put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Uh, schedule of functions attended by the Chief Executive. Uh, Councillor Oliver, thank you. Uh, Councillor Parker, put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Uh, just normal order of business, uh, a fixing of the common seal, which is pretty much every agenda. I'll move that from the Chair. Uh, Councillor Burt, thank you. Put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Thank you. We go now to 9.2, uh, which is actions register update and I'll just talk briefly um, through those and that is on page 32. Uh, for so, those that aren't aware because there's lots of members of the public so it's a good opportunity to educate you, uh, our actions register is just a way that we can formalise uh, requests that the governance team have made uh, from officers uh, and just that they get effectively reports uh, brought in a timely manner uh, and it's basically uh, looking after our work program, uh, which is proving really, really good. So uh, we'll just whip through this. Um, uh, where are you? First one, budget reallocation trial that's ongoing. Just stop me if anyone wants to speak to Yeah, Councillor Piddington. Just on all of them, uh, Nigel, I just yeah. wonder whether we should have... We've got a completed date, but we should have a date we're expecting them back. No, Because a totally. couple of them say three months. We're past that. Yeah. And we don't know what's happening. Yeah, no, no, and that's probably the other key thing is making sure we've got timeframes on them. So if there's any timeframes missing, we'll just ask, ask the um, chief executive just to put some timelines on. We can pull that offline, but um, thank you, Councillor Puddington. Um, now, trial opening, Aringi Stadium Park in the weekends, discussions with partners around the April school holidays. Um, we'll just keep moving on. Just interrupt me if there's any discussion. Um, Workshop with VT in progress. Uh, the um, that should be closed out now. So report requested on ombudsman update. That is so the ombudsman is closed. It is closed, isn't it? So we just need to. We'll yep. get the final report here. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, option for freedom. Uh, option for freedom camping. Um, that's ongoing, and I've had offline discussions with uh, Brendan, and we will bring that. Uh, traffic management. Uh, sorry, the options on freedom camping payment. I'll push a button. Because um, I'm just weary. It's been probably it was raised almost three months ago. You know, we're gonna. We actually need to get some action and start. Yep. No, so I have offline talk uh, with Brendan. So there's two things that have been looked at. There's policy and also there's effectively a payment um, solution. That's basically it, Brendan, but isn't it roughly nutshell? But we'll make sure there's um, something coming back to the next meeting. How's that? Um, perfect. So 
Uh, but I, th I think the key one with that, uh, Councillor Booth, is we've got an option for next season if we want it. Yeah, is the key one. Uh, traffic management would like a quick update. Uh, Mr Dixon, potentially, are you able to just give us a quick update on the timing of that? So this, just for uh, members of the public, uh, Council spends all roughly 20 million on roading, as you're aware. Road cones, you see them from time to time. Um, we are just keen to get in, uh, we're effectively investigating our costs into traffic management. But Mr Dixon, I'll throw the floor to you. Yep, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we're still working on actually uh, looking at the costings of, of tra temporary traffic management um, across the business. It does, yeah, it is. Um, we have, will have a report that we'll be presenting to Council probably um, next month on this issue and some options that are potentially available. Um, it, is, it is complex. We have a, it's quite a, um, a high level of regulatory framework that's involved with it. So, yeah, we just need to consider it. OK, so timing probably won't make infrastructure next council meeting. Next council weeks. meeting, yeah. Perfect. Uh, brilliant, thank you. Um, Subcontracting uh, sub across council, uh, stay there, Mr. Dixon. The infrastructure group is looking at alternative ways of carrying out various uh, services, obviously 17A review with parks uh, and some other things. Is there anything further to update on that? Yeah, that's, um, there is opportunity, I guess, um, where we go with parks, so you yeah. know, we could end up with um, another option effectively to undertake these services. So, but yep. we are certainly discussing this across council, you know, particularly around rubbish collection. We have three different contractors collecting rubbish at the moment for parks, for waste and for roading. Um, so there is definitely some efficiency opportunities there. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one is around uh, procurement on Invoices. I think we just need to put a um, date to this yeah. too. We, we need to have this done by April, so it's a case of just pulling the data. So okay, we'll get that. Yeah, it is a data retrieval. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. So next meeting, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, so process on agenda prep. There should have been some changes uh, in there with chairs, uh, et cetera. Just being uh, more over the agendas, is that happening? Can I just confirm that? Uh, specific officers are working with uh, chairs. Yeah, enough nods. Perfect, thank you. Um, activity reports. There's just a few that we do need, and the reason why I wanted these activity reports to come to f uh, for in a forward manner to council, so forward meaning that we see the next three months work, is uh, an example that sits out in the communities is the bin audit that we're taking bins out of the likes of Muka Jordan, those sorts of places, but we aren't aware of it before it's happening. So there's been some reasoning, and, and, and yeah, <laughs> uh, the drop ins that I did yesterday uh, talked about rubbish bins a lot. Uh, so it would be good that some of those forward work programs do come to us so that we are aware uh, why and we can have better conversations with the community. Um, Underutilised assets, I know that's a long uh, burn, Mr. Chief Executive, but um, I'll just maybe allow you to put some times around that offline. So if the you like. first, the first, we're doing these in tranches. So the first tranche should be able to come in about April. Next council Sorry. meeting. Yep. Perfect. We're gonna have another full agenda. Make sure you get a, a seat early next time. Um, uh, template for final uh, financial impact. Uh, I know uh, CFO is working on that. Uh, so that's fine. Yes, it is a double. Um, uh, social housing, we've got um, that request in and we've got a report shortly. Uh, Non-core assets, uh, sort of underutilised assets, same thing. We might just condense that, actually, Rachel, if you could make a note uh, into one. Um, so I'll go now to... Oh, yes, so uh, Councillor Oliver has raised uh, for this meeting uh, around some of the Geraldine uh, burst water mains. Councillor Oliver, would you like to briefly speak to that? And I know that infrastructure is going to provide a update to the meeting on the 16th of April, but do you want to speak to that briefly? Yeah, we've just had some um, ongoing issues on a couple of streets of Geraldine where water mains burst way more than once um, a year, obviously. Um, 
we thought it would probably get replaced because we were talking about replacing the water main, which would have helped that problem, but now we're sort of um, not going to be doing that work now or it's being deferred, um, that we just would like to see that looked at a bit closer and see how that water main is holding up. Uh, so, yeah, something just looked at and yeah. maybe some work carried out would be good. Yeah, brilliant. So we've got that update. It's a bit of a theme of our, going to be the theme of our long-term plan. Sweat until you can't sweat no more. Well, we can't sweat any more, so we need to invest uh, more. Uh, and then we've got workshop and water standards coming as well. Um, so any further comments on that one? No, I'll uh, move that. Councillor Booth, happy to second that? Perfect, thank you. Put the motion, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, uh, carried. Uh, now, as I said, I'd move the agenda around, so I'm gonna bring the Council uh, Social Housing 9.15 uh, forward. So welcome, um, Nicole, and that's on page 242. Uh, floor's yours. Thanks, uh, Nicole. Thank you, Worship, and um, councillors and members of the community board and um, the members of the public that are here um, to hear this paper. So, as requested, I brought forward and have instigated the 17A review, and that is outlined in the paper here as to the requirements. It is normal practice for council operations um, every six years or so to actually review all of its services that it delivers in-house. Um, or externally, and to make sure that it is continuing um, to deliver a service fit for purpose and within a reasonable budget. Sorry, and within a reasonable budget. So, following on from that, and earlier discussions in workshops and otherwise, where councillors had actually requested and looked at um, rentals and um, were we comparable to other local councils, etc. So that all formed part of the paper and the both options are there. Just to give you some background at the moment, um, we are 94.5% um, fully occupied. So we've actually had a really good run on units being uplifted. So Pariora is full, Timaru is full, Tamuka is full. Uh, Geraldine, we have two units that have just recently come um, to the market, they've been updated. And Pleasant Point now has one, and we've got to do some work on that unit. We've got, meaning we've got 12 um, available. Four in Timaru are just undergoing um, a change from the bed sit in a makeover, and five in Tamuka are undergoing the same. So those will come to the market over the next four to eight weeks as they're completed. And then the one uh, that we have at Pleasant Point, approximately eight to nine weeks, budgets dependent. Um, with, that we have available. From there, we've got nine people in Timaru on the waiting list and three in Tamuka. So we are starting to get a lot of interest. I've done a little bit of early work in regards to costs at rental across some of our, um, so Waimati for very similar, are sitting at 160 to 170, fairly 155, and then they jump to two bedrooms. Twizel 155, um, then we've got Oamaru, um, 145 to 210, so they're quite high in regards to local, local options. Then we did look at Palmerston, Hampton uh, and Dunedin, and then Ashburton, which are very comparable to here uh, at the 140 to 160. Sitting behind these um, are different reasons why and policies for each of these councils. So this information will all be part of the 17A review where we will be able to do a proper market analysis against how we offer the services, why we offer the policies associated, and then the rentals and why those rentals sit at that price. So that will all come through. In putting option two forward, that has been part of a discussion about whether we raise the rentals earlier and we would have been in touch with, um, we will be after this meeting, all tenants just to inform them officially um, as per um, the paper that we are conducting the 17A review. The 30% um, is on average the amount in dollar value that had been talked about around the room, but also in looking at some of the numbers from our comparable. So it's a 30% and also noting that we don't charge per unit, we charge per person. 
So maybe a little bit different to some of our other um, local councils. I'll leave it at that, and maybe there will be some questions um, from the floor and those questions that were brought up by members of the public. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, look, and I'll just touch on some of those questions. I think you've covered the 30%. Um, uh, obviously, we're very aware of the impact on individuals. Whatever happens, there needs to be some good communication going back out to residents and fully understanding uh, actually the benefits of the 17A review and just safety of uh, their tenancy, I think, is probably one to highlight. Um, uh, 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 yeah, our, our money is ring fence for social housing, so it's it's not to um, pay back any other activity. So it is within the activity. Um, part of the 17A review will be reviewing uh, policy associated uh, with that. Um, sorry, should have written better. Um, you know, I think that probably covers it. If there's anything else, I'll just let you speak to that. Um, but we'll go now to questions. But the key one and the opportunity uh, for this is there is subsidies sitting within government that we tap in, but they aren't provided directly to when councils are providing um, ha uh, social or community housing. We call it council, uh, or calling it council community housing effectively. Uh, there's models uh, that work really well for a variety of reasons. So you've got a Queenstown Housing Trust model, and it's quite a different, uh, you know, it's a different market down there. Uh, so their goals are probably slightly different than what ours uh, would be. But probably Wellington and Christchurch are good examples of community housing trusts, which effectively mean money can be invested back into this space. And effect effectively, it supports your social housing, which might you know, be provided by others, whether it's other um, you know, providers such as Kyung or, or private uh, providers as well. So it's to look at what options there are out there. We haven't done this for some time, and we've got considerable assets sitting in there. Uh, you know, 230 uh, units. How do we actually get best uh, use out of that asset um, so we can provide better for those uh, within that vulnerable community. So it's very much m meant with the best in intent for those people. But I'll go now to Councillor Pittington was first. Hi, Nicole. Mine's a technical question. You say we charge per person. So do we have any examples where we have a one-person and a two-bedroom house? Per person seems an unusual way to uh, rent property. So I don't, I don't know the background of why um, it became. So we've only got bed sets and one bedroom, so we don't have any two bedrooms. And we have couples that go in some of the larger um, one bedrooms, so some of the newer ones. So they pay per person, but should one of those couples pass away or something happens, the other one gets to continue and drops down to that one. So there are units where we do receive a double payment for that one unit, it's the two people, but then it drops to the one person if something happens. So it's been put that way. Again, this is all part of the 17A review that we can actually change that policy and work towards um, possibly a, a per unit price or one bedroom price instead. Yeah. And we do have, just to give you that further um, stats, we have approximately 13 couples. Uh, Councillor Booth and then Councillor Pye. Um, thanks, Nicole. Um, so the, your thirty percent, you come that numbers come around, come out by your background work in regards to looking at other districts. Some of these, yes, and some of the conversation around the room in regards to possible rentals. So mm. I looked at the, the, the what we were charging across, because our rentals. Um, go from 1960s bed sits all the way through to recently new ones in 2008. There is a range of rentals. So instead of actually trying to come up with a number per one, it was better to look at how we average that out and a, a percentage that would give a standard increase across each of them in that, in that range. When was the last time we actually did a, a review? We, well, we, oh, it would be before my time, I have to say. Um, and as I've been here three and a half years, and they go up in their long-term plan each year in regards to set in the fees. But this has been a departure this time with the 17A, and obviously the changing what is happening 
um, and that review to look at now moving towards a higher rental. And so part of this review perhaps would be uh, um, re looking at um, how often we would review those rents yes. going forward yes. rather than just possibly six years, it should be probably every two years. Yes, so you are allowed, as, as per the Residential Tenancy Act, to increase once a year, and that has been our long-term plan, but certainly in the 17A review, we can then look to um, taking them out of the normal percentage you set across all of those and actually treating them slightly differently and looking at. And the 17A will come out with how, and coming forward, how you wish to actually operate that group of flats going forward. So, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Pye. Uh, just a couple of things. So when you do comparisons with other areas, I, I would have thought you'd be better to make the comparison as a percentage of the market in that area. So rather than comparing us to Waimati, you would go Waimati's is set at 70% of the market value of a house in Waimati. Um, I would have thought would be a fairer comparison. Um, but then I do have a couple of questions, So, and it kind of follows on from Councillor Booth's questions. If we put the rents up in the last annual plan, we are unable to put them up again until the 1st of June, so we can't do anything immediately anyway, can... 1st of July. You can... 1st of uh, July, yeah, yeah. So some, um, what we normally do, because the um, leases are all on different dates throughout the year, when you make a decision normally you have in the long-term plan, the 1st of July is your reset, and from that time, we do a letter to every single tenant for the year, and then we keep all of the letters, and then they go out during the year, each month set to the times of the anniversary of each of their years of their rental. Yeah. And my second question in relation to that is, if you're putting them up on the anniversary, do you still need to give 60 days notice under the tenancy? So that's what we do. So they're all timed, each letter goes out, so that it is in time for each of the tenants, and then we help them should they need assistance. Yeah. The report says immediately, it's not actually immediately, no, it's no. as they come so as of now, forward. Yeah. If, we were, if, if any new rentals going forward would be the new rentals, if you made that choice, and then going forward, we would actually then, at the anniversary of each one as it comes up, it would be that appropriate increase. And did you, um, it's not in the report, but did you work out what the dollar value of this would mean for council and what money we could have to reinvest into that housing? I haven't at this stage because... It, um, Depending on a percentage, and this will all form part of the 17A, but because we've actually leased out quite a number of properties over the last six months, we've had an increase in the rental coming through. Um, I will come back with those details, uh, but I haven't got them at hand right now as a percentage of, of an increase. I did a back of the envelope calculation and it was about $500,000, yeah. which is yeah, it's quite a lot. Mm got the same envelope. Uh, Councillor Burt. Um, I can see why we've jumped into an option two that puts a 30% in there and it's something that around the table here councillors have discussed at length around fiscal responsibility and looking at how we value um, what we do for our communities and everything. So I see though that uh, you know our preferred option is and it has to be that we go for a 70A re review, 70A. Um, it's likely to trigger a um, a, a significant, um, significant. So it needs a full consultation, and I'm sure we wouldn't miss that out anyway. So, and, and so based on that, uh, I think in the discussion we've had, I'd like to move that we take option one. Yeah, uh, Councillor Scott. Yeah, I, I support that. I do not support option two. Time. I think the point of the 17A review for me is how the best way we deliver the service for the benefit of the tenants and I think that was our original intent is to look at you know, are we best to deliver this or is there a better mechanism to support our community so I'm definitely in favour of option one. Brilliant. Thank you Councillor Scott. So we've got uh, Councillor Burt has moved, Councillor Scott has Seconded it, uh, option one. Would anyone else like to speak for? <laughs> uh, no, all good. Anyone want to speak against? Or, or Councillor Booth? I don't want to. Um, I, I really think this discussion should be based around the numbers, quite frankly. And I can't see how you can possibly make a decision without looking and seeing what the income is and what the, what the cost of providing that service is and putting uh, an appropriate margin on to 
see that we are reinvesting in that stock and keeping it up to a standard. Uh, so um, I, I really think we need to uh, have more information. I'd like to see some robust, robust numbers to see what everything means and where it's at, at the moment. So I can come forward with that information, but it also will form part of the 17A. And I am coming back with that 17A uh, towards the end of May, very early June. So that work is underway now. <coughs> Yeah, just a follow-up, I mean, that's what I thought was intrinsic to 17A, and it included all those figures. I mean, you can't make a decision without understanding that, so a very good point from Councillor Booth. Yep, brilliant. So, yeah, Councillor Pennington. Just a reminder, social housing is one of our portfolios. We have a number of other properties that I believe a number of other people are getting so-called cheap or discounted rents. When, when are we going to see that as well? So we've got, a pro we've got eight other properties that are linked with um, areas of infrastructure, etc. They are all now at market rate. So that began three years ago and they've been worked up. Yes, we do have some members of staff, but they're not there for any particular reason or any discounted rental. They are at market rent and they're on residential tenancy agreements and pay directly. Can we see that list? Not yes. necessarily the staff yes. member, but I'm yeah. keen to know what properties we own and why we own them. Yes. Yeah. I'm keen to know why too. I, I wouldn't have thought that was core business of council if you say they're not linked to infrastructure. No, some, so they are, sorry, they are. They've they been are, bought sorry, with pieces of land for infrastructure or other reasons. Sometimes they've come with a house on that land. So the airport is, is a prime example. And so we rent that out and we manage that on a commercial basis. Um, at market rental, though um, it's, it's on for land for a purpose that we can't yeah. sell at this stage. Yeah, it's the class, uh, house at Claremont, house at the gardens, those sorts yeah. of things. So yeah. uh, we're going to move her in second. Any further discussion? Uh, I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. And um, can we just, as far as the comms, can you, we just uh, have that um, go past us before that goes out to... Yes. Uh, residents. Okay, brilliant. So we go. Now, I think what we might do is bring 9.16 forward, which is the Theatre Royal and Heritage Facility uh, closeout uh, while you're there, Nicole. And so I'll pass to you, uh, Councillor Shannon. And so that's on page 245. Thank you, Mayor Nigel, and um, everybody found it. Page 245, the recommendation being that the Council approves option one, the preferred option. Notes confirmation of receipt and of detailed design from South Base. Notes confirmation of receipt of a cost estimate for detailed design by South Base Construction and approves South Base Construction to proceed with the tender procurement process to achieve a fixed lump sum offer for construction. I'll hand it over to you, Nicole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Mayor and councillors, members of the public and the community board. So before you, um, and as you know from previous papers, we've been on this journey with South Base to, um, through developed design. Once released into detailed design, which is part of their contractual arrangement, um, they have produced what we call the, the fleshed out drafting information underneath the developed design. So the developed design is the design and they've produced now the documentation that is required to go out for tender and procurement. So that's what detailed design is. The project team have received the detailed design, so the documentation, and they're starting a review. Um, but that is ready and we've also received a cost estimate from South Base in line with that detailed design. Um, unfortunately not able to bring those numbers to the table. What I can say is they're favourable and with that we had requested. Um, that enables Council to undertake commercial um, negotiations. It allows South Base to now go out um, on tender and procurement and, and bring us back the best possible price from the market. Yeah. And I think I'll leave it at that unless Beth or Andrea would like to add anything. I'll open it to the floor and... Um... Thank you, Nicole. Any questions? Oh, it looks straight over to Stu, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Scotty. Just making sure we're on the way. 
Um, I've got three or four, so I'll get them all out of the way. Um, in point 10, it talks about off-ramps. Can you tell me what an off-ramp is? So the, um, and actually not usually my language, um, but it is something that um, I discussed with our CEO, and it notes that um, in the agreed scope and the developed design, um, sorry, so point 10, I'm just looking if I've got the same 10. Um, no. Could you repeat the question for me? Oh, sorry, the paper talks about off-ramps. So that's actually part of the contractual arrangement. I would not normally use that word, but you have ability during the contract where you can get out of the contract. So they're called an off-ramp in, in certain construction language. Okay, yep. cool. Apologies. Um, point 17, um, it might be just my wording, but it says some um, there... It's recommended the council continues the contract process to lump sum, no problem, and then make the decision to accept the offer. The decision may be not to accept the offer. I just want both options. Yes, yes, and that will come. Yes, sorry. Okay, so you're not going to come back and say you agreed. No. no. <laughs> I've been caught before. Nearly. No, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> point 32. Look, I'm concerned the language we use when we put stuff out. For debt repayment, an operational surplus has been used to fund. There'll be no operational surplus with the theatre. So I, don't, I can begin to answer, but I can also have Andrea. So I'll, I'll, um, So with the theatre, we'll be, we'll, be, we'll be striking rates at a certain rate. Now, that is to cover the operational costs, plus the operational costs are also covered by revenue that we generate. Now, if we, re if we generate additional revenue over and above what we budgeted, that should go against the debt. So that's what that means. So effectively, we do our, our annual plan. Here's the revenue we expect, percentage of rates, percentage of income. Here's our costs. If that income is higher and that particular unit runs at a surplus, there's no reason why that shouldn't be repaid off debt. And what if it doesn't? Yeah, and what if it doesn't? doesn't, then it's, it's um, a draw against the, the, the whole council as a whole. Okay. My final question is around the scope that they're costing. Is, is that everything we desired? Because at times we've taken stuff out along the journey. Yes. So are we getting the cost of everything we desired and then take things out? Or are we taking things out and the cost is going to be less than we desired. So, um, hard to say what is the desire because we, we started with a very long list of things, but um, for Council, we did come forward, and again, I can't go into a lot of detail, but there was items that we called in a green column, which would have absolutely no effect on the outcome of the, um, the building and neither would it have had an effect on the desired. They were almost over-designed, but everything else that we brought to you on what was an amber list and what was a red list has actually been incorporated into the detailed design, and that has also been brought forward in the cost estimate. And we're very pleased to see what the cost estimate is, so we've managed to get everything So in. that would mean a sealed car park, a new roof, because we had a report saying the roof wasn't good and there was some debate around that and we we're going to leave an old roof on it. Yes. So it's a new roof now? Everything in. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jay. More questions? I can see Councillor Pye's got... Can, can I just... I'll, I'll clarify in plain English. We've gone to South Base with our full scope. They are putting the full scope to market as requested that will drive the confirmed cost. We do have a list of items that we could pull out and we had to, of which the reference crews knows what those items are. At this stage, they won't be pulled out, but if the cost comes over budget, then we have to make a decision whether we pull them out or not. Is that, is that plain English? Yeah. That's perfect. That's what I wanted to know, because halfway through that, they were bounced in and out. And I just wanted clarity around that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, th so what we are doing today is obviously confirming and, and acknowledging 
feet of the detailed design and the detailed cost estimate, um, and you have confirmed that it reflects the agreed scope. But I ha am a little bit nervous that we haven't actually cited anything. Yes, you're acknowledging that it's all um, within budget, but my understanding is that our external consultant team will not have done their work until after the 19th of April in its entirety. So we're sitting here today, and yes, South Base have dropped their detailed design report, but our own external consultant team haven't even had a chance to review it against our scope, our budgets, our ambers, our greens, our reds. And so I just wondered um, if we are setting up our subcontractors locally um, for a bit of a hit, really. So my questions, I've got three questions. What impact does it have if we just wait for three weeks to actually get all of the our external reports? So that's question one. What are the costs going to be incurred by Council between now and July? So that's my second question. And, um, you know, as I said, my, my real concern is that South Base are going to put out you know, tender document, we're going to have, gosh, you could have anywhere between 50 and 100 subcontractors um, quote for that, and that can be up to tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're in three weeks' time, if we held off, we would be, you know, we're not setting up our local subcontractors for a, for a hit, so... Yeah, I'm questioning why are we sitting here today when we could have waited three weeks and everyone in this room would be able to make an informed decision. So I will be receiving, um, thank you Councillor Scott, and I'll go through the, the three questions. So we will be receiving the official documentation on the 4th of April from South Base and from the project team. So it is, it is in receipt of the project team now. They have begun their review and it will take a number of weeks for... Um, the full review, as in they go over the information, but on the 4th of April we officially receive that. Timelines, um, and what we don't want to do is, is well we could, end, if we did delay, and certainly we can if you wish to wait, we would then be coming to you in mid-July, towards the end of July, because that three weeks would go on before, uh, we would have a fixed lump sum for you. So. We don't feel as a project team, and certainly that is the advice I've got, that waiting is going to make any difference. They've, they've been with South Base over the last few weeks on before we've received the information to begin that due diligence um, work, and I will officially receive on the 4th. Wednesday, we had a reference group meeting and you hadn't received it, so... No, I, I received it on the, on the 4th of April. Well, the 4th of April is only 26th of... March today, so you're receiving it next week, and then the external consultancy team will do their full review of the of the report, and then provide a re report to you, which is after the 19th of April. Yep. That's what we got last week in a report. Yeah. So on, when I receive it on the 4th of April, they have already begun that review, but then they'll do a further. It's it's a timeline of information. I don't believe, and neither do they, that there will be any changes to what has been put in front of us or them to date and on the 4th of April there's and I've been talking to them today they don't believe that there's any issues mm. um, so I'm, I, I would not have put this forward as let's go to market now South Base wouldn't begin tomorrow obviously we've got the Easter break so they would they would begin next week um, if they got the go-ahead to actually start that tender mm, procurement the Because the, our external consultants won't just be reviewing the South Base um, document, they'll also be looking at our, our own um, internal works that need to be carried out and our enabling works, as we talked about, those three areas which will make up the 57.1 million. So, uh, so I presume on the 19th of April, all of that will be gathered and the council could make an informed decision. So you, you, you can wait until that time. Um, as a project team, um, we have got a lot of that information. Our other works above the South Base costing, so that's our client side. Uh, we've already built that picture, otherwise we wouldn't have put this forward and brought the information to you. 
um, as I said, I receive official information. The team are in receipt. They've already started their work. Um, the actual QS team have been working alongside South Base for the last two weeks, nearly three weeks. To, they've opened up their books and allowed them to begin that process. So they are quite confident that they're not going to find anything um, awry in that information. Um, so I stand that I feel I can confidently put this option in front of you, but it absolutely is your choice should you wish to wait. Um, just just through you, Mr Chair, I think there's a parallel process going to happen. So effectively, the, the consultants working for Timaru District Council will be completing their review. Well, and we are not the ones going to the market. South Base is going to the market. South Base will be working up their tender documents at the same time. Yes. Now, if there's any differences, those tender doc documents would be amended. Yeah. Then they get out to market and we get our responses back. Um, it's all about working parallel, not one after the other, no. and that will save us time. Yep. We are very cognizant of any time delays, and we're trying to be expedient in regards to getting out to the market and then getting that fixed lump sum here to you for review. Thanks, Nicole. Councillor Pye. Oh, you didn't answer. What was the cost incurred? Oh, sorry, costs incurred. So it'll be the remainder of the contract um, for the developed and detailed design with South Base there on that last um, area now. So it's hard to give you an exact number, and then there would be costs incurred in regards to um, our client side group, our project manager, and our QS. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd like to be here, what, another million dollars? Um, no, I, we're, we're past that point now. The majority of the 3.6 that was agreed has been paid. Um, so I, I would, I can't, I can't give you an exact number right now. I'm sorry. I would have to look at that, and I, can, I certainly can come back to you. Councillor Pye. I'm probably quite supportive of Councillor Scott. I'm, I'm very nervous that we are not going to deliver this on budget. Last time we sat around here, we talked about taking a whole lot of stuff out so we could deliver it on budget. And I ask you, what is the risk, which is mostly reputational, of us going out and having all those contractors spend all that time and then us getting the final number and going, we're not doing this, because if it's not 57.1, I won't be voting for it, um, versus a little bit more time, three weeks in the scope of eight years that we've been talking about this, I would have thought it would be more, to use Councillor Booth's favourite word, prudent, <laughs> to wait. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, and, and if you, uh, we can wait for that three weeks for that information and bring it to the table. Um, obviously, bringing you the cost estimate and the info would have to be in public excluded because those numbers are being used out in the market as part of the procurement, but I can certainly do that. Just through you, Mr Chair, waiting is not going to make any difference because we have a detailed design, we have a cost estimate, that cost estimate potentially won't change because the contractor has done a significant amount of work on that building and they understand it very well. The next stage is getting to the market to see what the market will bring, which is unknown to all of us. However, the QS working for both ourselves and for South Base have worked it up and they believe that it's doable. Now, if it does come in higher, then there are some decision points. The decision points are, do we actually start looking at some of the items we had on our um, value engineering? Do we actually exclude some of those? Or do we actually push harder on South Base to bring the cost down? So effectively, waiting is just delaying getting that fixed price. That fixed price is our number one decision point. And I believe that we should let those two parallel processes move along so as we can get to that point. Um, there's going to be nothing gained by delaying, I don't believe. I'm just nervous that we haven't seen that. That's, that's what, and you're asking us to make a decision, and we haven't seen that information. The last stuff we saw was, yeah, was back in November. Which it isn't really materially changed. What we have is numbers that are saying it's 57.1. The big number that may or may change is a contingency. 
Now that contingency, there is contingency on both our side and on the contractor side, which we are working out to say it needs to come to our side. That contingency at the moment is sitting at? It's sitting at, oh, I'd, I'd prefer not to give the exact number in public. Sitting at a fairly I high percentage. Yeah. Now if South Base is saying they've done the amount of work they've done, that contingency is probably higher than it needs to be. Yeah. But again, you need to let it sit there while we get through this next yeah. stage. So the contingency that um, our CE is actually talking about is an escalation contingency over the tender and procurement process. When they get to the end of the tender and procurement process with a number, then that contingency in part or whole comes back to us. So this is what we're actually working through now, and it's the fixed lump sum, um, as Nigel has mentioned, that we need on the table. Indicators are that this is all doable, but we need that fixed lump sum from the market. I still raise my concerns that you, you're sitting here today, you're, you're saying you've cited it, I have not. And if we talk about November, it was not within budget. So w there was a vote and it carried on. We've spent another $2 million. And if you're saying it's the same, that makes me extremely nervous that we, we're again, that we're not within budget of 57.1 million. So, the, the, I'll take um, the the numbers are within fifty seven point one. With the amber and red included, which will be over fifty seven point one. No, that means your value is engineered almost five million dollars out of the project. The numbers we've got are within fifty seven point one. Again, it gets down to how much of that contingency do you need. Do those numbers include the sealed car park, the power, the works that need to go on around the building? Because that's what I'm still not clear about. So yes, um, we have we Sorry, have without using budgets elsewhere in council. Yes. So the market has moved. South Base have done uh, um, some early indicators, and we have made sure. We, so we put aside within our client side some items to cover power, etc. And we've made sure that we can cover everything in there. They've come forward with, and I asked them to bring the entire scope back in and give me a cost estimate for that entire scope. So I've had several conversations with them um, to do that, and it has been favourable and surprising, which is, is, it, which is good, and everything on the scope list is in there, and we have accounted for the other items I appreciate that you haven't seen the information. It would have come to a public excluded meeting. I was requested to come forward with a public meeting, um, yeah, but it is all in the, in, the, in that I guess cost estimate. The best thing I've ever learned in governance is show me, don't tell me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The longer the conversation's gone on, the more concerned I've actually become because I was in that group that there was clearly not enough budget for. We're now being told it's all in and into the number. So I'm, I'm just unsure how that is possible because we had a reasonable cost overrun and we took things out to meet the budget. We're now being told they're all put in and we're at the number. So I'm a bit like sh uh, Michelle, show me the number. I'd prefer to wait. So unless we go to the market with everything in, you will never know what the real number is. So we have to go to the market, get the total number. If that number is within, then, we, then we're fine. If the number is over, then you have a decision point on whether you pull back on some of those value engineering items or not. And that is, when we talk about um, off-ramps, that's an off-ramp. So we can work, we can bring you the um, numbers and public excluded, You'll look at those and you'll go, and you'll go, well, well, we'll debate them and we'll be in exactly the same position we're sitting here today. Councillor Bird. Um, so I get a feeling that there's been a movement since last year and to now in terms of the economic environment that we're in, um, the availability of work, um, obviously the cost of um, 
of a lot of raw materials that are coming into the country. And I do know there's been a significant downturn in terms of the availability of which, which does have an impact on how people uh, quote um, and accumulatively, and including our trades, which we've seen. Are you saying that that accounts for that amount? And the second question is, in terms of uh, Councillor Pye's um, contention that we uh, have a risk uh, from uh, reputationally, I was just wondering in what way, because in terms of the narrative today and the amount of work and due diligence we've put into this, and, and including what we've spoken today, I feel that we've done the work and we are in a position where we have to make that decision to move this based on it, but the first one is obviously the key. So in answer, um, Councillor Burt, we, um, we've, we asked South Base to seriously look at our budget. They knew that we were under very tight. They are aware of the 57.1. Um, they have not been aware of any client side amounts that we put to one side. We gave them a working construction number. What they had built in when they come through the prelim design and then they come to the developed design is a lot of escalation because there's a lot of unknowns because they've got part designs at that point. Now, as we've gone through that design process and they've gone through the detailed process, they've been able to go, okay, we can see exactly how that is going to form, how it's built up, how much material we need for that particular point of the build we can now do our numbers and come up with a specified amount. And we needed them to go through that process into detailed design. That is what happens between developed and detailed design. They have now done that and I asked them, what does the number look like with everything in? Now, I knew that they needed to get rid of their, a lot of their escalation in their numbers. That's the whole process. They came forward and I was very pleasantly surprised to see those numbers. They had then removed a lot of the escalation as they firmed up those numbers for us. So that has been the shift. Yes, there's a shift in the market. The market is softening. Um, and I am actually, not just this project, but I am receiving phone calls from the market asking for work. So there definitely has been a change. That has enabled and is working in our favor at this point. Um, so this is why actually going out to market, as our chief executive has noted, we will get a sharp number. It's the only way to get a number now. Um, and um, unless we test the market and allow South Base to do it, if the number is not where you want it to be, then you have the off-ramp. You have that option to step out or pull items out should you choose to. Indicators at this point are that this is a doable because we're beginning to get out of those cost estimates as we've moved along this process, get their escalation out of, out of those cost estimates. And that's what we're seeing the benefit of. As they reduce the cost escalations or the escalations and contingencies, that allows us and has allowed them to bring those other items in. In regards to a risk, um, we have looked We've done a lot of due diligence on this, and I do appreciate for those in the room um, that you would like to see that information. We will be bringing it forward. It is there. We can't talk about it in the public domain. Um, but the project team have worked very, very hard. They have the best interests of council and the ratepayers in mind. You've asked us to keep the costs down. We have gone away and done that. What we've also done is brought as many of those scope items to the table as we can. Um, and we are equally, from November to now, had to wait for those numbers to come in the cost estimate. So, um. so sorry, I thought you said before everything within the scope was in, it but is. now you just yes. said you've told them to bring as many of those scope items as oh. possible to the table. So are so they all in or are they not? They're all in. So during the developed design to the detailed design, as they removed any escalation and contingency, they were able to move any items that we had may have to sit out, and they brought them into their cost estimate now. So we've now got a cost estimate with all items in, and it has landed in a more favourable position than we thought. So they are all in, confirming that they're all in. 
Okay, thank you. Any more, any more questions? Or... Councillor Oliver? Uh, Nicole, um, will there be a full description of the cost of the fit out when you come to us next time? Yes, so that is part of what we're also working on. Yes. Okay, cool. And that one other question. Are you doing any work around fire safety within the building? Is there so, any, any costs associated to that? That is already within the scope, and that is part of what the construction group do, and they have fire engineers within um, the detailed designs, and it is all built to be part of the requirements for building consent, and, and will, is, is already costed in. So, yeah, no further. Councillor Pye. Right, I have one more question. When you come back to us with that cost and detailed design, will we also have a detailed business plan on how this is going to run? As in estimations of how many shows we get, how much they're going to pay, how much it's going to cost the community to use the facilities, staff, that, that kind of detail? So I can answer that. Um, Councillor Pai, uh, we are currently in the process of developing that model. Um, it's, we have drawn down data from comparable facilities across the country to be able to understand what we think some of those costings and um, revenue items might be. That will be an ongoing um, item for refining as the process becomes closer to uh, completion. We won't be able to predict at this stage exactly what that's going to look like in 18 months, but we can provide, to the best of our knowledge in this context, what we think that might be. In terms of the operating model itself, that is also being researched at the moment, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if we can bring it in July, um, because that's an ongoing piece of work, but we will endeavour to get it, hopefully, by that time. I will, can, I will say, however, um, initial estimates in terms of the operating expenses associated with both the, the theatre component and the museum have been factored into the long-term plan. <coughs> Stu's got one more. Well, Just last one. So, but this is what confuses me. If you've factored them in, you must have a paper showing the numbers to get there. So I would like to see that next month or whenever we come back because we get kept bouncing around. We're not sure we're doing this, that. If you put a number in the long-term plan, there must be calculations behind it that tell us how much staff, how much of a loss it's going to run at, you know, Ashburton, a well-run theatre, loses about 400k a year. So I want to see some numbers. Thank you, Councillor Pinnington. Um, a paper was produced to Council, uh, uh, to the Community Services Standing Committee in November last year, uh, and that provided some high-level figures, which was formed the basis for the calculations that have gone into the long term. I, I guess I accept those, but you're now saying you're refining them. As part of this process to keep us fully informed, we should be seeing, I guess, how those calculations came apart. Because at one stage we've got two million in, sorry, to then do something with the old museum that so, came as a surprise to most of us. So, Councillor Pillington, um, this paper was an update and to get approval of the detailed design so South Base could go to market. We did, have a, we did have numbers in here. I took them out because what I want to do in June, July is bring the total package to you. So we've got the fixed price, we've got the operational plan, so this council can look at the entirety of the whole together and go, yes, that makes sense. Perfect, that's what I was asking for. So does that mean, uh, Councillor Puddington, that you, we're ready to move to the recommendation? Are you moving that, are you? Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Do I have a second to please? Thank you, Councillor Jackson. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Oh, sorry. Councillor Scott. An informed decision without citing, so I'm, I'm voting against. Noted, thank you. And was that you too, Councillor Booth? No. <laughs> oh, it's just... <laughs> Back to you, Your Worship. <laughs> Anyone else want to change their uh, mind on votes from three months ago? Or... I'd just, okay, like thank to, you. I'd um, just like to say, um, if that's count, an example of council asleep at the wheel, then 
we are doing pretty well when you get uh, discussions like that. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, moving on. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Shannon. Um, uh, where are we? Okay, back to now we've done what 9.15, 9.16. So we'll go back to the original agenda. So we're now going to 9.3, which is presentation of Arari Tamuka uh, Fikli Otop. Um, so I think we've got Glenn. Welcome. Uh, thanks, uh, members of the public. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Uh, do we have a... Yep, no, perfect. I'll pass uh, on to you. Thanks, team. Right, uh, thank you, councillors. Um, for the opportunity to uh, present to you today. Uh, you will have uh, had the update uh, report um, already in the papers. Um, I assume you will have read that. Um, from there, I just uh, wanted to give a quick update as to where we've got since that paper was written um, and their progress to date this year. Uh, as some of you will be aware, um, the Zone Committee uh, is in somewhat of a holding pattern at the moment and uh, our key uh, role is the allocation or recommendation for allocation of up to $75,000 to projects within the OTOP zone uh, for the enhancement of their water quality and resources. Uh, to date this year, um, we haven't allocated uh, all of those funds. Um, we have, uh, I'll just give you a quick rundown of, of what we have allocated. Uh, just under $5,000 has gone to the Arari Protection uh, Group for uh, some work around monitoring our bat population in the Arari Gorge area. Uh, we've allocated an, another uh, $12,000 to uh, some work going on in the Berks Pass area, uh, restoration of a site there um, by a, a couple uh, with an historic house. Um, it's very hard to see from the road, but they're doing a lot of, lot of work there, um, replanting with native, native plants around the, um, the OP River. And at our last uh, meeting, um, we allocated $20,000 to the Barks Creek Catchment uh, Group for a long-term um, program. They're looking to introduce dung beetles to the catchment um, to reduce the nutrient and sediment um, coming out of the catchment and affecting the waterways. Uh, we haven't been overwhelmed with applications this year as we, wish, we hoped we might be. Um, it is still seems to be a struggle to get uh, the, the level of interest that um, we would like out there. And not to say there aren't things happening within the zone anyway. Um, many groups are simply getting on and doing things themselves. An example of that is that, is that Dung Beetle project where that $20,000 that is being matched by the landowners um, as well as voluntary work going in as well. So there's, there's a lot of good things happening in there. It's not just reliant on the zone committee. Um, the other um, thing that is happening uh, this year is with uh, ECAN reviewing the role of the Zone Committee. Um, as I alluded to, we are in somewhat of a holding pattern um, as the Zone Committee was set up to, to deal with the, um, the plan changes and consulting with the community um, in our area. Uh, whether that uh, role is still um, best suited to Zone Committees, what the Zone Committees are best suited to going forward um, is all under review um, and we'll be workshopping with ECAN uh, early next month um, on that, um, and that will be ongoing through the year, um, potentially getting back into that zone um, with the implementation of what comes out of the regional policy statement, but as you know, a lot of that is up in the air at the moment. So we'll watch the space with interest. So uh, if you have any even questions, I'm, I'm all yours. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thanks for the update, really appreciate that. And as you've mentioned, we're in a bit of a, a hiatus, if you like, but um, looking forward to uh, what comes out of that review as well, because uh, I think there still needs to be you know, representation, so I think we need to start thinking about what it, what it can be rather than what it's not, and there's some great examples. Uh, and still I appreciate all the time and effort that 
uh, you know, you and, and others put into it, um, Glenn, from a you know, voluntary uh, point of view, uh, pretty much. So, um, yeah, any questions for the team on, on OTOP? No? I did enjoy the riveting uh, conversation around dung beetles uh, at the last one. So it was, it was a bit of an eye-opener in education, so some fascinating conversation. So um, appreciate that. Uh, no questions, so I'll move that report. Uh, Councillor Scott, perfect, thank you, as a seconder. Uh, I'll put the motion now. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. Brilliant. Thanks, team. Thank uh, you. Appreciate you waiting and taking the time to present. Thank you. Thank you, Doki team. Um, now, do we have uh, QV uh, here? Uh, yes. Oh, perfect. Welcome, team. Uh, so I think I've got Brendan and Chris, is it? Yep. Yep, perfect. Uh, welcome, and got a presentation we're about to put up. Awesome. So welcome, uh, and I'll yeah, pass over to you to uh, introduce yourselves and uh, go through the presentation, and I'm sure there'll be some uh, questions that's always uh, of interest. Lovely, thank you, uh, and thank you for having us here today to present to you. Um, my name's Chris Rogers, I'm the South Island Operations Manager for QV, and this is Brendan McCurley, he's uh, the Canterbury Region Manager. Um, yeah, and obviously we're here to talk to you about a successfully implemented Timur District revaluation. I um, just want to be covering just a wee bit around the legislation and the rules. Uh, a wee bit on the process. Uh, Brendan's going to talk to you about the revaluation results. Um, and then a wee bit on objections and the key dates. Um, we're governed by the Rating Valuation Act of 1998, um, which is supported by the Rating Valuation Rules. Um, that Act um, gives power to the uh, Office of the Valuer General that audits our work uh, and certifies the revaluation to go out to the public. And over, over the last, sort of, just to give you a little insight into the environment we, we've been working in for the last sort of, three, four years, that uh, regulatory pressure has become uh, a lot more intense, I shall call it. Um, and the, the level at which we need to get the values and the supporting information to is, uh, is a lot more detailed than it has been previously. Um, part of that has been at the initial audit stage where the Office of the Value General sort of implemented a, a traffic light system, which is uh, stop, you've done a terrible job, orange, pause and rethink about it, and green, you're good to go. And then they've now turned that into what we call in-house um, the OVG rainbow, because they've thrown a few more colours in. Um, so for the Timaru district revaluation, we received a blue, which is a proceed on the normal time frames, um, but there's a, a, a bit of follow-up work to com be completed, um, and that resulted in a small delay to the normal timelines, um, just some minor changes needed to be made. Um, and then part of that is the capacity of the Office of the Valley General, the auditors, there's only so many, and they were unavailable. Uh, just a wee bit on rating valuations um, versus market valuations. Um, Rating valuations are a snapshot at time. Timur District, District Council is the 1st of September, uh, 2023, and they'll be used for rating purposes for the 1st of July. Um, you know, as if the market changes, we've had a very turbulent last three to four years on the property market, as most of you will be aware. Um, whereas that market changes, our rating valuations stay the same, and we perform role maintenance, and it is all based on uniformity as at that date. So the market keep goes on, and we're back to that date, how we value with our, our role maintenance. A um, little bit on rating values. They exclude plant, chattels, and um, trees. And they are based on a freehold title, um, not a leasehold interest. And the biggest thing is that they are set by the community. So we interpret sales data and on the market data, and what um, the, the market tells us, that's where we set those value levels. Uh, we've been on our process. Um, our process is a lot about collaboration with council, and that's been a big uh, focus this year. And Andrew and the team uh, have done a great job there. Um, we, we we look at all the sales throughout the district, particularly those ones around that sort of September first date. Um, the different property types. We'll look deep dive a bit deeper like for rural properties, uh, commercial, industrial. Um, there's only so many sales, so we look at on the market data. 
Uh, and that's that gathering that secondary evidence. We're looking at what's on the market. We're talking to agents. We're talking to valuers in the district. Um, just to um, gather as much information as we can. Then we process that um, sales analysis, detailed sales analysis. We have an initial market adjustment, which we get internally peer reviewed. We'll have inspections in the, in the field and using various um, tools, um, such as satellite imagery and such. Um, and then we will complete further analysis and our quality insurance processes come into play. So that's something we're proud of uh, that we've implemented as a result of that extra regulatory pressure. We've actually got three former Valuer General auditors um, in our in-house team now that will audit our work before it goes through. Um, so that they come in after we've done much of the market research. We'll have an internal review. Um, then we'll validate the val values out in the field. We do a lot of um, validating by using tools and also in the field. Um, and then the quality assurance team comes in again. And what else we did this year with Timaru District Council, we had um, an internal review from two valuers within the council, which was really beneficial, or two people within the council, sorry, that um, really assisted with our process. So just that adds with that collaboration, making sure that our values are, are making sense. Um, I will breeze over this quickly, but that we've, as another result, we've had to, uh, we've created a platform for all our um, IT team. It's created and we get all sorts of boring numbers and tables to look at that us valuers love, but I won't bore you with most of those. But we're, we're constantly developing all our tools to make sure that our values are robust to go out into the community. Now, another thing we've been producing of late, in the last two years this was released, our own QV in-house map, which is designed just for rating units. Um, and that has various layers that really supports us, that was really um, supported by the Office of the Valuer General. Um, and that has thematic layers, and then you have Timaru there um, in a thematic colour. And yeah, that's enough about us. We'll go into the revaluation a bit much, sorry. Um, and hand it over to Brendan. Yeah, so it's part of the revaluation pro process. We, um, we do a strategic overview, so it's helpful today to know what's going on in the district, of course, and it's also helpful for the auditors who audit our work to know what's happening. They come down from Wellington and they review a lot of districts at the same, you know, throughout the year, so it's good to know for everyone what's happening. Obviously, population growth is up in Timaru, as you're probably all aware. Um, unemployment is up slightly, but it's still below national level, so it's at a pretty good level at the moment. Um, and local GDP figures are up as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys know better than anyone what the, the main kind of industries in the, in the district are. So obviously your rural, your port, your rural servicing type industries. Um, and obviously a lot of industrial there as well. Um, in terms of the actual values and how those played out, um, residential property is probably obviously the most important, I would suggest. Um, you know, it makes up 72% of the properties in the district, and of that, you know, the residential values make up about 43% of the total capital value of the district, or 41% of the land value, which is obviously what the rating base is for Timaru. Um, this is the QB house price index, that graph there. Um, the black line shows where the values are at, at the previous revaluation, so we do these every three years. So the last reval date was at 1st of September 2020. Um, and you can see, obviously, the whole country had quite a large increase throughout 2021, um, particularly towards the end of 2021. Um, and it kind of peaked around you know, the start of 2022 to mid-2022. Um, in a lot of regions, we've seen decreases from that kind of unsustainable peak. But with Timaru Residential, it didn't have the same kind of increase. Like, it was still a significant increase, but not the same as other districts. It was more of a realistic sustainable increase to residential property values. So it's kind of stayed around that kind of peak level, um, you know, from early 2022 and onwards, which um, it does actually make our job a little easier, to be honest. We've got a nice, stable kind of property market to be working within. Um, so that was good. Um, for the residential um, Market overall, we increased capital values by 26.2%. Uh, land values went up by 28.4%, which is your rating base. Um, and just to put that into perspective, I guess, um, your, your typical section now in North or South Timaru 
is sitting around two hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars in your prime new subdivision. So you know, out west, um, you know, average sites are ranging between two hundred and eighty thousand to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars now. Um, and then yeah, central Timaru, you're talking more three hundred and sixty-five thousand for you know an average land value. Um, in terms of house values, um, the ranges we've got on this on this presentation are quite broad. It's hard to narrow things down for a presentation like this, but um, you know, a typical three bedroom dwelling can range from $370,000 to $600,000 now, um, or a four bedroom dwelling, $430,000 to $680,000. Um, this graph here shows um, the capital value and land value movements that we, that our new values are showing through, through the different um, sales groups of Timaru, so we break different parts of the township into different sales groups and obviously you know, Geraldine is the one on the far left so that's its own kind of grouping of values there. Um, you'll notice the four graphs to the right are showing the, the highest increases in, as to, in terms of a percentage. Um, so that's Geraldine, Pleasant Point, um, rural Timaru and Tamuka. So those areas have seen larger um, They've seen larger percent increases because typically they've got, I guess, a lower starting base, um, and that's pretty much as expected. You know, your lower values will move by a high percentage in these kind of revaluations. Um, yeah, onto the yeah the business. Um, I guess the main talking point for the business for you guys would be that the industrial land has gone up by 55.3 percent, which sounds like quite a lot in the last three years. Um, I guess the key drivers for that was that industrial has really been a really strong performer throughout the country, and in a place like Timaru, it is quite a strong industry. Obviously, you've got the port there backing, backing it as well. Um, and yeah, I guess a lot of, um, a lot of land out like at Wash Dyke Way did see significant increases as well. Um, a lot of that land was basically at pretty much rural levels, but we've seen sales evidence out there um, at much higher industrial kind of levels. So. Those are some factors probably attributing to that. Um, yeah, move on to the next one. In terms of a rural, I think yeah, dairy and pastoral make up the majority of it. Um, dairy values are up 8.4% on the land, while pastoral is up 16.2% overall. Um, I think the reason for the higher increase for pastoral is that it's typically lower values again to start with. Um, and probably a, a few less pressures there about the dairy, that's you know, impacting the dairy more so than pastoral property types. Um, and yeah, this is basically the overview of all the property category types for Timaru. Um, the one that probably stands out to some people potentially would be the utilities values, how that has increased by 50.1% on a capital value. Um, now the capital value, obviously the utilities covers like a broad range of properties, so one of the main ones there would be the Council of Free Waters. Um, there's been a lot of capital expenditure there over the last three years, and obviously it's kind of based on um, you know, the cost approach as well, and with costs increasing so much in the last year for construction and for everything really, um, that's mostly been the reason for that large increase. Um, the land values only increased slightly. Now the utilities, a lot of utility type properties don't actually have a land value, that's just the way they're rated under the rating rules, so that's why that level is quite low. And also the irrigation schemes, the land values for those properties has decreased and that's due to a change of methodology um, from the last three years. Basically the Office of the Value General has changed the way that we value those types of properties. So those have actually seen a decrease in land value and that's partly why there's quite a low land value increase for utilities types. Um, and obviously yeah, industrial stands out there again, which you mentioned before. <coughs> um, and that matches the graph showing the, exact, the same data we had on the previous table. Um, but as you see, industrial land value is really standing out there. Um, mining is as well, but there's only about 18 properties that are mining category, and they're quite low value to start with, so we're not talking big. Um, major issues there. So as part of a revaluation, um, everyone has the chance to object to their values if they're unhappy. Any ratepayer in the district can object 
to be values, um, and the ratepayers have until the, f um, the 5th of April to have, get those objections in, um, which is next Friday. Um, people can object through our call centre. We've got our websites, so they can lodge online, which is the best way for people to object if they are wanting to, to go that way. Um, there's no cost to object to the ratepayers. Um, you know, we, that's part of our contract with the council to handle those objections. Um, and with a cut-off date being 5th of April, we'll be looking to start processing those objections from, from mid-April, basically. Give a, a few weeks um, grace for those objections have come into us, and that's when we'll get back into the field and inspect these properties and make sure we've got the values right. Um, and just to summarise the key dates for the revaluation, so our effective date is the 1st of September 2023. Um, the owner's notice was posted out from the 20th of February, um, and they've got the, they can object until the 5th of April, and these new values will be used for rating purposes from the 1st of July this year. Um, I guess we'll open up to any questions, if anyone did have any questions they'd like to ask. It's probably too much detail going down, but do you take into account earthquake prone buildings in any way? Do you get a list from the council and change their capital value accordingly? Yes, so we get, um, I guess the council's properties are all now on the, the national register, for earthquake prone buildings, so we do use that data. And if we haven't got allowed for it, then we'll, we will make an allowance for that. Um, it's hard for us to know exactly the cost for each building. It's case by case, so we do make general kind of allowances based off what we know from the market and other evidence we've got. Um, and if people aren't happy still, I guess they can object to that. Um, and in terms of, on the other side, when it's getting repaired, like that is normally through a consenting process, or it's getting taken off that list as well. So those are the ways we kind of pick, pick up that. Yeah. And, and just a follow-up question, it's probably we have to do it rather than you, but there's a, there's a difference, I guess, in the value of commercial buildings versus retail. I noticed a number of properties in Stafford Street have actually decreased rather than increased, I guess, reflecting. So what sort of, do you just look straight at what pro properties have sold for to average that out? I was just interested. Yeah, so commercial properties are based on an income approach in most cases, so you know, based on you know, the market rental and a market yield as well. Um, I guess along Stafford Street we have seen more vacancy compared to three years ago. Um, there's still a lot of demand for space <coughs> from like local businesses and things like that, but there is a, a noticeable increase in vacancies, I guess. Part of the revaluation process, we send out surveys to business owners as well to get those sort of market rents and we get, collate that information. So it's used in, in that case. Yeah, and just conversations with agents and things like that as well. Yeah. Uh, Council Oliver. Um, just looking at your yeah, owner's notices were posted on the 28th of February. I know a lot of people didn't get them until the middle of March. Are you pretty firm on your 5th of April deadline for your objection? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's you guys that are firm. Um, we can go over. We just, it'll be case by case. Is there a reason for that? Is there, is, what? No. Okay, that's a bit strange. <laughs> oh, okay, well, maybe we need to look into that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe to see how localised that is. Yeah, yeah yep, okay. that's right. But yeah. it is case by case, and it's council. We um, will have a period afterwards, and if they're coming in late, council will, will advise whether they'll accept it or not. Yeah. Typically, we do accept them late for the first week or so, and then it's up to the council to decide case by case, case by case, if they want them or not. So, yeah. Alrighty, uh, yeah, uh, eyes on the prize, guys. Uh, any actual questions? Yes, perfect, Council Spy. Sorry, not a question for you guys. Um, so who pays for this? Is it Council paying for this? And if we rate on land value, why do we even bother getting... It's probably... Oh, sorry. You okay? Um, I guess, sorry, I'm but yeah, obviously... We, we have to. So we, we, we value on capital value and land value. Um, it's a lot easier for us if it's capital value rated, in honesty. Land value rated, it takes a lot. Um, 
It's more of a fine tooth comb from the Valuer General, and in this case, the Deputy Valuer General, who is a Timaru born and bred um, rural chap that knows every property. So um, that makes <laughs> things fun. Um, but yeah, that's the, the by the Rating Valuations Act, we have to provide capital value and. I guess part of the reason is that councils can actually change the, the, the way they want to rate, so I think this had to be maintained. Yeah. I think you can set it not specifically to you guys, but we were going to do a, a rating review ourselves that was put off because of three waters. Is that back now on the table? And yeah, we, we discussed we it this very morning. So um, <laughs> it'll be a full revenue review, including rates. Where there'll be winners and losers. <laughs> it's not a great uh, one, isn't it? But anyway, okay, uh, any further questions? That's really insightful. No, uh, thanks, uh, Chris and Redden. So the motion is just to receive a note of presentation, so I'm happy to move that. Councillor Burt, seconder. Put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, they carried. Brilliant, thank you. Thank oh, you. That's awesome. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>